All right, everybody, this is Ross, and welcome back to another episode of Fruit Talk. Uh, this is the podcast style video that I do for you guys every Wednesday night at 9 o'clock Eastern. We talk a lot about fruits, a lot about vegetables, how to use some of that stuff in the kitchen, how to grow it, really just how to grow the tastiest food possible. Um, last week's episode, guys, if you had tuned in. I know some of you guys were on the the live stream. It was actually a live event as we do them. We do this episode, this this podcast live every once in a while. I haven't done it in a few months, really maybe even six months. Um, a lot of my Wednesdays are taken by other things. I play tennis. Um, this Wednesday, actually, I have a board meeting, so I haven't really had time on Wednesdays to actually do anything live in quite some time, but they're always a lot of fun. I really enjoy them. We do a Q and A at the end. So if you want to join in on these live streams, you have to just visit the YouTube channel. It's just youtube.com slash Ross Ratty. I know that, um, a lot of you guys already are aware of our YouTube channel and a lot of you guys probably really, that's where you guys came from, but the podcast is growing. It's pretty interesting, um, to see now that it is getting a following it seems like it is uh expanding quite a bit in plays in uh in views i should say et cetera, et cetera. um yeah i don't know that's pretty cool because on youtube we get i don't know somewhere around 400 to 800 views a night which is great i think that's uh that's awesome but it's nice to have some sort of outside um, source of traffic, bringing um, viewers and, and really growing the podcast, growing the channel, uh, just growing the brand, whatever. Um, so I am going to upload the live stream episode that we did last week. Depending on how big the file is, it was a two-hour long episode. I don't know exactly how long that's going to take to convert to an MP3 or whatever file format it is that I convert them to. And then I'll have to upload that. We'll see just how long that takes, whether or not I decide to upload it. But certainly if uh, we do a live stream episode, it you will get notified if you subscribe to our videos. Uh, you hit that bell button on the YouTube channel. Often I'll either announce it maybe on Facebook or Instagram or on the blog. Another announcement, by the way, is that on the blog, we've been doing some giveaways for charity. Um, there was recently two events that had impacted uh, some fig growers that I know personally and I'm friends with. Um, one is my buddy Doug up in uh, Northern California, and his son lost his his home to the fires. Uh, Doug is really just spending the majority of his time helping other people to get through this insane time. Um, he lives right outside of Paradise, for those of you guys who are familiar with that um, paradise pretty much the entire city burnt down to the ground so um, he's in a really bad place and a lot of his family his friends um, are you know really not doing well so I've decided to give away um, some cuttings to help support um, his efforts and then also my buddy Joe, uh, Joe Puckett down in uh, Louisiana, um, is actually doing more fig breeding than anyone I've ever I've known um, or know to this day. Um, he's been doing a ton of breeding for a number of years, and um, he got hit with Hurricane Laura. I think there was actually two hurricanes that came in. He was telling me about how there's a chance that he could be right smack dab in the middle of two hurricanes, which is pretty much... Um, Regardless of what happened, or regardless of if that happened, he got hit really hard. It was a ton of flooding. He lost his home. There's uh, toxic gases, and, and just he's just a mess. Um, and his fig orchards, by the way, a lot of his trees are damaged. There's a lot of damage to the whole area. I mean, it's just not... Uh, it's just not good. So what I did is I, I created on the blog, figboss.com, uh, there is a couple links here. One was our first giveaway of white Triana. We had basically just said, uh, name this particular variety. If you can get it right, we'll give away 
some cuttings and then in return you uh it's required that there's a minimum donation of fifteen dollars to support both causes and this is kind of slowed down we did this last week uh, because we have a new one here part two we're going to do a number of varieties that we're going to give away and part two um no one's gotten it and I've pretty much kept it now exclusive to the blog. I, I warned people and told them that this this is what's going to happen. A con, you know, a consecutive amount of giveaways on the blog. And um, no one has gotten it. So I think this one actually is a little too difficult. And I'm also sort of doubting <laughs> the actual authenticity of this variety anyway. So it's kind of like, do I even really know what it is? Um it's a strange one. I'll say that. Um, it's been a weird, it's been a little bit of a weird experience with that tree this year. It's so strange because it seems like it's morphing in some weird ways. Every fig is like very different than the others. Um, but that's just what you get off a young tree, but it should be this one here. I'm going to, I'm going to stop this one and, um, we're going to do a new one because I think this one's just a bit too difficult, but I, th I thought that someone would get it because I thought someone would just randomly guess Smith, but that's when, that's what this one here is supposed to be. And, um, it looks unusual. So I figured it would be very difficult because it doesn't look like your typical Celeste. And I'm still, as I said, off of this particular, tr or not Celeste Smith. I'm sorry guys, but, off of this particular Smith tree, I've had a number of figs and it just, they all seem very, very different. And I've been really confused by it. Um, I still think it's Smith, but we're going to have to really, um, I think evaluate the next couple figs that come off of this tree just to verify, uh, that it is indeed Smith, but kind of weird how it all happened to be honest with you. Um, so that's the giveaway there. Um, really quite simple. You just guess the name of the variety and it will be, I am going to create a new post on the blog here. Um, letting people know. So th this episode though is really about my garden next year and really just growing as much food as possible in that space in the garden space that I have. You know, I, uh, we did a video actually this morning. So before this podcast is released this morning on the YouTube channel, I'm going to be releasing this video here that you're looking at. And this video is basically about, um, gardening or growing food in your garden plots, basically 365 days out of the year, which I thought was impossible, but in actuality it's not. And this should have been what I've been doing all along. Um, and I never heard anybody really explain it clearly, I guess. Maybe it's been explained before, I'm sure, but you know, to really maximize growing the food in your yard, to, to really maximize the space in your yard, you want to grow food all year, right? And you always want to have something in the ground, essentially. I mean, that's like a key right there of doing that. So what I realized is that my summer garden pretty much produces for either four months out of the year or six months out of the year. It depends on the crops. So some of the crops in the garden right now that are going to go to six months or go all the way till frost. So basically May all the way to November. Those would be things like the tomatoes, the peppers, the eggplants. Um, the watermelon right here is still kind of going strong. So knowing that, well, what can I grow in the wintertime for the other eight months out of the year? And I realized you could grow alliums. We've talked about this in a prior episode of, of Fruit Talk where you plant the alliums in the fall after the summer crops finish, and then the alliums go all the way throughout the wintertime, and then you harvest them in the spring right around the summer solstice. And right around the summer solstice anyway, when is the summer solstice? Okay, it's June 20th, but really right around the summer solstice, you end up harvesting a lot of these alliums. So, uh, but for me, you can, and usually you will harvest a lot of those alliums, things like garlic, onions, elephant garlic. Well, I haven't tried the elephant garlic yet, 
but you could harvest the elephant garlic really early, in fact, for leeks or other purposes. But um, let's just say you wanted to harvest all the all your alliums by June first, and that's historically when my garlic has been ready in the past is right around June first. I can even go back and look at the harvest videos that I've done of my garlic now for a few years. So what I'm trying to get at is that if we plant our alliums in the fall, harvest them in the spring, this lines up pretty much perfectly with when I would plant these summer crops anyway. So I was like, oh, wow, that means I can use this space all year round all the time. Um, so that's what we're doing. We're we're making that little bump there. And that's what this video is all about is even, even using the you know, you can go over to this part here, even using the, the spring garden in conjunction with the fall garden and having food all year round as well in that sense. So um, these garden beds will be full continuously for the foreseeable future, you know? Um, and I think that's really how you get the most amount of food out of such a small space. You know, this here is roughly... Um, yeah, I want to say about 16 feet in width, and then maybe two and a half, two and a half, three, maybe 10 feet deep. Yeah, about 10 feet deep and 16 feet wide. That's the garden space I have available. That's it. And then if you look back at the summer garden, this is a 15 feet deep plot by 10 feet wide. So that's 150 square feet here. And the other plot is roughly, um, you know, almost 150 square feet. So 100, 160 square feet roughly. So I only really have, let's just say, 300 square feet of, of growing space. Uh, and that's not even counting some walkways and things like that. So if I have 300 square feet to grow food, it's not really a whole lot of space, right? Um, but I was able to this year, if you saw some of the videos and me following along with the podcast, you know that I grew a lot of food this year. And um, we're going to change our view here a little bit. We're really, we're going to keep going here and changing the different things that we grow because uh, we keep learning, you know? So one of the things that we, like I said, we just learned was that we can grow food all year, basically. The next thing I just learned, which I thought was just so interesting, was actually growing mushrooms in your garden beds, essentially, or different ways of gardening with mushrooms. And uh, I know a lot of you guys love mushrooms. Uh, there's a lot of people out there um, that watch actually some of my mushroom videos because we have this year finally had success with our wine cap mushroom patch. Um, this spring we had so many mushrooms I didn't even know what to do with them. I couldn't I couldn't eat them all. I had to give a lot of them away. Uh, it's been extremely dry here, um, extremely dry, for the most part, and therefore um, that bed that the wood chips are in, where the wine caps are, they have not produced anything um, for the remainder of the season. But they will continue sometime next year, I imagine. Um, I thought the fall would get so wet, it usually does at this point of the year, that the mushrooms will just stop, start popping up. So I figured in the summer I probably wouldn't have any. Um, but, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily matter to me um, because, you know, mushrooms work in strange ways, honestly. So if you, don't, if you just don't have the right conditions, you just won't have mushrooms. And... Um, this video here from North Spore, for anyone that knows North Spore, um, they're a pretty good company that's putting out some um, good products. I don't, I'm not sponsored by them, but I wish I was in a way. Um, they, uh, they put out some great products for mushroom spawn, and they have this video here, obviously, which I found out, I saw today, and it's really, really informative. Some of it, however, is not practical. So what they're doing right now in the first part, they go through different ways of gardening with, with mushrooms. And they talk about this first one here is actually mulching the pathways with wood chips and 
and in the wood chips you can grow the wine caps right that's exactly how i did it with um with mine but the only difference is i did them underneath my perennial fruit trees so underneath your perennials you have wood chips you just inoculate those wood chips with wine caps uh, they put down some cardboard here for the paths they put the wood chips over the paths they put the spores down and then they cover it again with more wood chips and uh it's a success without a doubt um works for me worked for them it'll work for anybody uh the next thing they did here um was actually um they inoculated straw and they put the straw down underneath their garden beds so my this one i don't feel is really all that practical um and it obviously it depends on where you live and it depends on you know what you're growing and also the situations just there's so many situations for this that i think this is a great idea for a lot of people but it's not a great idea for me so what ends up happening here with this straw is the same thing you you have your plants in the ground um or you can even plant them at the same time you put the straw down and inoculate the straw but let's say you had um you know my spring crops as an example i wouldn't necessarily want this and this is where it gets a bit squirrely is i wouldn't want this on my summer crops the summer crops need a warmer soil to perform well and um if i'm putting mulch down on top of the the garden beds so if you look guys here at my summer bed if i mulch this whole thing I'm going to get a lot less production, a lot less performance. Everything's going to be a bit later because everything's going to be colder. The soil is going to be colder. And the summer crops, like your eggplants, your peppers, your melons, your tomatoes, etc., your cucurbits, whatever, they need a really warm soil. Putting down straw or any mulch is only going to cool things down. So that eliminates doing this in any form with the summer crops. Now, maybe there is a situation where you could get away with this on the summer crops. Maybe if you're in a greenhouse or something like that, a high tunnel. But I wouldn't want to do this out in the open. I think this would just completely kill my season, believe it or not, if I did this. So while I think this is a great video with many great ideas, I don't think this is a – it's for it's not for everybody. There's different applications, as I said. The other situation where I could see myself – do, I could see myself doing this, but I wouldn't, is actually with the the fall crops or the spring crops. So if this, as an example, is their spring when they're filming here, and these are things like kale and whatnot, and they put the straw over top of the kale plants, inoculate the straw. Well, what does straw do, right? What is a straw, what is straw going to encourage? It's going to encourage slugs. So if you have really high slug pressure, which I do, and slugs are a problem on some of your vegetables, then you just don't want um, straw on top of your vegetables because straw is only going to encourage them and give them a home, give them a hiding place. If the birds can't see this, this, the uh, slugs, you don't keep things nice and tidy and clean and the soil is um, you know, really pristine, even... Even removing some of the lower leaves of the plants can really help discourage slugs. And uh, if I, I have a feeling if I were to do this, I know for sure if I were to do this over top of, uh, you know, let's say over top of my fall and spring vegetables, I would have too much slug damage, and this would be a horrible idea. Now, here's where this would be the best and I think I'm going to do this but I don't necessarily I'm not going to grow I think potatoes next year um, I don't really have the land for them um, maybe I'll try them at the community garden but if it's at the community garden I'm less I'm less inclined to go through the trouble of inoculating straw because what I like to do with my potatoes is I pile the straw on top. You know, that's how I hill them. Instead of hilling them with dirt, we hill them up with straw. We have many layers of straw. It keeps things wet. It keeps things dark. Two things that potatoes really want. 
um, at the soil level and it really does it does well with the potatoes so in the potatoes it, it would work and I actually had this thought this year believe it or not before even seeing this video was that could be a possibility but I was like well the issue is when you take the when you take the potatoes out of the ground and you're digging up the the ground and all that the straw is going to have to come up first and you're going to damage the mycelium you're going to damage the mushrooms and I just don't think it'd be likely that you would get enough mushrooms to really make this worth it. I would rather just have a dedicated bed of straw for mushrooms. And, um, yeah, I think that, I think that really, I think that really makes a whole lot of sense is that I just can't, th this one to me just doesn't make sense for someone in my climate. If you don't have slugs, I would feel, I feel like you've, if you lived in a dry place, you guys didn't have slugs. This would probably be like the best thing you could do. You live in the Pacific Northwest. It's pretty dry there. The straw would probably be really awesome. And, uh, you know, it would it would certainly be worth it. The next one is actually doing it, like they mentioned here, or as I mentioned earlier, is just doing wood chips underneath one of your trees, your perennials. You do the wine caps with the wood chips. If you're doing the straw, you got to do some kind of oyster oyster mushroom. There's a bunch of different oyster types that they've mentioned here in this video. It's really quite simple. The next one I thought was pretty cool was actually doing logs, um, inoculating logs with shiitake as an example. And then um, you use these logs to create a raised bed, essentially, is what this guy did. Um, so these are the outsides of the raised bed. I think that's pretty cool. Not for me. Um, first off, I can't get logs. It's pretty difficult to find oak logs um, that are fresh. And also, you know, I pretty much have all the wood that I need at this point. Um, so for me, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But what he did, he, what he's doing now is actually he's inoculating the soil with the pink oyster mushroom, which I thought was really the coolest thing of this whole video, I think, um, is that he goes through this and after building the raised bed with the shiitake sides, he then inoculates with grain the um, the bed here, just the just the soil, which is pretty damn cool because it's amazing how certain mushrooms will grow on certain substrates. And then, right after making the bed, he just plants in his his plants for the spring. So it makes a whole lot of sense to me, honestly. Um, my issue is with this: is how much success am I really gonna have? You know, um, I would love to have just pink oyster spawn underneath all of my beds, but is this really practical? You know, I, I don't really think this could work. Um, it might work on, you know, I guess some of the, you know, some of the spring beds, the, the fall beds, but certainly not the summer beds because the summer beds are going to be it's going to be dry for the most part you know um i guess it depends on your condition my conditions that year i i just thought this was so darn cool and um this is their pink oyster mushroom here and they do say um let's see here We've had success growing oyster mushrooms in our raised garden beds by sprinkling grain spawn in the beds in the spring. So yeah, you would you would do this in the spring. Um, I guess maybe you could get this to work in the summer. Assuming the summer soil wasn't too dry, um, I guess this could work. Maybe if I, you know, maybe instead if I put down the grain spawn and then in the spring right over top of that you put down new compost new soil and maybe that would be enough to keep the garden beds moist or consistently moist for an extended period of time to give these mushrooms enough of uh, of the environment to then start fruiting it just seems a little bit unlikely to me that this would work for everybody I feel like a lot of this really depends on your climate. 
um, and your setup. You know, if, I've, if I'm irrigating everything, this would work probably really well. I just, um, I don't know. I think I'm going to try it because this is probably the coolest one of the bunch. Because if you go back to every one we just mentioned so far, um, none of them really work out too well except for the ones with the wine cap and the uh, the wine caps and the wood chips. And we already, we're already doing that. You know, we're already, uh, we've already done that. The next one though is actually growing. Um, this one was also very, very interesting, which was growing your wood chips in, uh, straw bales. So you can see they have the, the, the bales of straw laid out. They have the different types. There's the black King. There's a Italian oyster, the white oyster. There's a bunch of different oysters or something. And essentially you just, um, because you have the grain spawn, you make yourself little holes in the, in the, in the bale, you shove in the grain spawn and then it inoculates it over the length of the season. You got to keep it moist. You got to keep it wet. Again, I think a lot of this is just, uh, you got to really keep this stuff wet. I think, um, for any of this to really, really work, um, because that's just how mushrooms are, you know. So maybe this would be like a really great thing if you lived in a very wet place. Uh, even in the summer, it was extremely wet. Um, you know, even though it is quite rainy here in the summer, there isn't the point in which um, – there's a term for it where a lot of people use like it's they're talking about evaporation at certain times of the year the evaporation in the in the uh, is like higher or lower or something <laughs> I don't know exactly what I'm getting at here but essentially in the summer it's quite dry and it's also because it's so warm um and then in the spring and the fall you know that's really when the soil can recharge its moisture, basically. So I would be really, it would not be a, a common thing, a thing that happens often where I think mushrooms would be consistently occurring in the summer here um, or consistently growing without some sort of assistance. So I don't know. I think this is all really interesting. I think... Um, it's worth doing, obviously. Um, what I found out that was pretty cool about this, this straw bale is that by inoculating this, it really warms up the bale of straw. And if you did this in the spring, it almost could, like, in a sense, you could plant something in it. You could plant some melons, maybe. This would be a cool experiment, planting melons inside of this where the mycelium really breaks down the straw and gives the plants a lot of nutrients. And also that breakdown process is so warm, giving those plants a huge head start to the season. Um, that could be really, really beneficial as kind of like a mini compost heap of mushrooms, you know? So I thought, I just found that to be two of those things really, really cool. The one with the, the bales, the one with the soil, with the pink oysters. I just think this is so, so cool. If somehow I could get this to work, I think it'd be really worth doing and very interesting. The last one here is kind of just doing it in containers. And I'm not necessarily too keen on that just because of the amount of containers I currently already have. And then at the end, they show you the, the little harvest here of mushrooms and, you know, they're cutting them here out of the straw. They're cutting them out of the wood chips. There's one off of the log, and then there's one even off of the soil here with the pink oyster. I don't know how many of these pink oysters there would be, um, but you can see the soil is like completely shaded for the most part. And it, the soil looks pretty moist, so I would imagine these beds would have to be watered in really, really well for this to happen. But wouldn't that be awesome for this to be possible? essentially growing my summer crops here we have the alliums and then in the spring when we plant our when we plant our summer crops we add some soil we add some of the grain spawn 
And then we essentially have the best of both worlds. We not only have our summer crops here taking up a ton of space, but then down below where it's a lot shadier, hopefully a bit more wet, we also have mushrooms. I think that would just be so awesome. Um, it doesn't get more intensive than that if you think about it. And the, the mushrooms are really helping in all of this, you know. That mycelium really is breaking down um, the soil, breaking down the wood chips, breaking down the, uh, the straw. And that could, in a sense, really help out these different crops. Um, the last thing I want to mention here in this little video is that we actually have some plans to grow a lot of our crops this year vertically. Is that That's at least my intention. Uh, we're not going to give up on growing our melons vertically. I think that's real, realistically the only way um, that I can have good success with the melons. Um, uh, well, maybe not the only way, but the only way for me right now because I just do not have enough room. And these melons require full sun, a lot of space. You don't want to even have them two packed close together because the other mel some melons can shade each other out. And if you don't have, that's what I've realized recently, is that if you don't have the, the right amount of photosynthesis with these melons, you're not going to get the sweet fruits that you want. We've been talking about melons the last few few weeks of the podcast, and uh, I think that's what it really what it was, is that my corn was shading the melons below. Because they were shaded, for the most part, they did not get the photosynthesis, they did not get the carbohydrates to then pump those sugars into the fruits to make them as sweet as they could be. It wasn't like they weren't sweet, but they weren't sweet enough. And I think that's really the key is that I probably should grow them in full sun. Every single leaf needs to be preserved for as long as possible. Those leaves are so, so important for giving the plant the photosynthesis that they need to make those fruits sweet. So if I have disease, I have some mildew, I have wilt, it's just not going to work. The plants are going to die. The fruits are not going to be sweet. And I figure the, really the best way to be doing this is probably um, growing them vertically. So I think what I'm going to do, uh, because really if I can grow them vertically, that's going to ensure me that I have the most photosynthesis for sure. Um, you know, I can also limit the number of fruits that way. Um, all I have to do really is protect them from mildew and the beetle, um, from getting wilt. And if I spray the silica, the silicon like I had this year, and I continue to do that all the way up until they're they're being harvested, then I should have no problems getting very, very sweet fruit. I think that really is just going to be the key, is that it's a thing I have to spray. There's no other way around it. Maybe I'll graft. That's probably a really good idea is just to do it, just to do the grafting finally of these plants, of the annuals, get myself a, a wilt-resistant rootstock, graft the more susceptible varieties of melons on top, and um, and spray them with silica every, uh, every week or even every other week. Um, so what I'm going to do is actually grow, this whole area is basically going to be vertical crops, um, I think my melons, my peppers, or my peppers and my eggplants are more shorter. They're shorter growing crops. And I think those, I'm probably going to continue growing them in this raised bed. They need those extra soil temperatures more than I think anything else. Um, they really do benefit the higher up you plant them. The, obviously the warmer the soil will be. So what I'm thinking is that on this side of the raised bed, on this wall here, I'm going to construct, I think, a trellis, a vertical trellis of wood um, or something like that. Maybe we'll have some string, and this will just be the, uh, the trellis for some of the melons. Um, 
this whole raised bed I think is going to be dedicated to eggplants and peppers. Um, really was enjoying those this year and how I was able to cook them and, and use them in the kitchen and process them. Um, and then the tomatoes, I think, I mean, this is still going to have to be finalized, but I think the tomatoes will be in here the same way, grown vertically, up the EMT poles. Um, however, I really want to fill in this whole area as much of this with melons. So maybe we'll have some EMT poles for melons at the community garden. We're going to do the corn. Um, maybe we'll do like things like potatoes there. Uh, let's see what else do we got here. Here, I'll, I'll show you guys what I'm looking at. This is the garden plans for basically uh, this year. And Silver Queen, yeah, there's the corn. We'll also probably do things like zucchini and squash at the community garden. And that's a 30 by 30 plot. It's way more space. It's about, it's more space than I currently have at at my at my home so um that's going to be a huge amount of space that i'm going to be able to use i'm going to grow things uh, i'm going to try to grow a, a lot of beans next year whether they're green beans shelling beans uh, beans for roasting um you know soybeans as well for the edamame we did get one harvest of the soybeans it was quite late and uh I don't think they liked the location that they were in all that much. And then here's uh, the community garden that we had some plans for. But I think most of this is just going to be corn. But if I grow corn here, the issue becomes the fertility. You know, I'm going to have to come here quite often and actually really feed the corn every time I'm there. Um, because I'm not planning on being there all the time. And I'll tell you, if I if you don't feed that corn, it makes a huge, huge difference. Even irrigating it is a huge thing. So am I going to be really willing to put in the effort to grow corn? Um, I don't know. I really can't say. It's kind of a shame. Um, it really is a bit of a shame. Because I really don't know if this is going to work. And um, it's kind of a, a like a good thing that I didn't grow corn at the community garden because there was no way I would have been able to feed it as much as I did at home and, and keep it watered as much as I did at home. I just don't have time to be at the community garden so often so much. So I think that's it here, guys. I think that's what our plans are for the foreseeable future. But at the very least, in this community garden, maybe if it's not corn... We'll definitely grow some squash. Maybe I'll grow some different types of squash, not just like zucchini or, or stuffing squash, but uh, things like maybe like pumpkins or um, some of the kabocha squashes and things that we talked about in prior videos. Like, um, you know, there's the delicata we've talked about. Uh, there's the um, um, spaghetti squash. And there's also the uh, the one that's so popular. It's like almost flamingo color on the outside. Oh my goodness, guys. We're losing our minds here. You guys know what I'm talking about. It's got a fat bottom, orange flesh. Uh, you roast them in the oven. They're good. Anyway, point is, is that we could do that at the community garden. And maybe we'll do some potatoes, you know? You never know. We got tons of room there. Maybe we can trial some things there if we want. And that'll be it. Maybe we can even do some onions. A second crop of onions there. All right, guys. Thank you so much here for watching this one. Check out the, the links that we mentioned in the beginning. The blog. You know, going on the blog. Consider um, supporting us on Patreon and following us along on YouTube. Uh, in case you guys are interested in any sort of live stream episode, we'll see you guys soon. All right. Take care and, uh, have a good day. I'll uh, see you guys next week.